The story begins 6,000 years in the past, presenting a desolate scenario where the world on the brink of collapse was under attack by the demon King Aridon. On the battlefield, filled with hundreds of corpses due to the fierce battle, and as the human world stood on the brink of extinction, our protagonist, the Lord of Dragons, Exegar, makes his appearance. Displaying incredible combat prowess, Exegar breaks an illusory barrier to reveal the demons that were hidden and ready to launch their attack against the Lord of Dragons. In response to the attack, we see our protagonist unleash some of his magical power to annihilate the entire demon army. Seeing how his entire demonic army is destroyed, Aridon, the Demon King, appears to confront our protagonist, revealing in the process that Exegar was his former master. Our protagonist, still haunted by memories of his disciple, asks why he had decided to become the Demon King and attack the human race. Demon King Aridon responds that it was simply out of boredom. Our protagonist, the Lord of Dragons, Exegar, knows that having used so much mana to get rid of the demon army, he only has one ability capable of defeating his former disciple. The Demon King prepares his ultimate attack against our protagonist, aiming directly for his heart. Aridon, content with defeating his former master, smiles at surpassing his teachings, but that happiness wouldn't last long, as our protagonist anticipated the attack and fulfilled the requirement to activate his most powerful ability, in Valley, an ability that balances the life of its caster but is capable of annihilating Aridon, the Demon King. As the battle ends and due to the severe injuries he sustained in combat, our protagonist knows that his time in the world is coming to an end. He decides to use the little mana he has left to cast his last spell, called Memories of the Soul, an ability capable of preserving his mana through time and space with the hope of reincarnating in the near future. This is how time slowly but steadily advances, and we see how the ability conjured by our protagonist is activated 6,000 years after the fall of the demon King Aridon. We find ourselves in the Kingdom of Rapha, a city that has already been rebuilt by humanity, and where stories about demons are now just myths and legends found in ancient texts. Initially, we see how our protagonist reincarnates in a state of fury, as the moment of his reincarnation is much further in the future than he initially thought. Nonetheless, our protagonist knew he was in a useless body incapable of perceiving mana. He found himself in the body of a young man known as Cain Rod Gell, a weakling who was tenth in line for succession in the prestigious Rod Gell family. The protagonist couldn't believe that he had reincarnated into the body of someone incapable of using magic and, worse still, born into a family known for its long tradition of sword fighting. The legendary Lord of Dragons, Exegar, the strongest being in the era of demons, capable of summoning magic skills at the tenth level, now found himself in a family fanatical about swords, and the protagonist was known as the weakest combat dog of the Rod Gel family. While the protagonist continued to curse and lament his situation, he was interrupted by two recruits who were mocking his current situation. They couldn't believe that the family's leader kept an incapable person unable to fight with a sword. While the recruits mocked our protagonist, they took the opportunity to mention the pathetic situation of his mother, which triggered the protagonist's inner rage, leading him to attack both recruits mercilessly. In another scene, we see Reban Finn, the fourth-generation member of the Rod Gel family and the official tutor of our protagonist, having a conversation in a tea room with Raya Rod Gel, the ninth most powerful fighter in the Rod Gel family. Reban asks Raya what the reason was for her request to meet with him. Raya mentions that the family leader had begun a period of solo training and had left new instructions on how the family hierarchy would continue. While reading the letter, Reban shows a concerned expression and thinks that he must immediately warn his pupil about the new changes in the family's policy. Reban leaves the room immediately to find our protagonist in the training field, giving a severe lesson to the two recruits who had harassed him and his mother. The protagonist lets go of the two recruits to talk to his current tutor, who hands him the letter detailing the changes made by the family leader. 
After reading the letter with the changes, the protagonist becomes enraged with the family leader because the requested changes directly affect him. The letter mentioned that the family leader would go into seclusion for private training but not before leaving new instructions for all family members. The letter stated that the family had a long history of producing excellent swordsmen and for this reason, if any member spent more than five years in the training camp without passing the tests to enter the castle, they would be banished from the family. Our protagonist didn't really care about the prestige of the Rodgel family, but he felt anger and frustration because his mother would also be banished from the family due to not meeting the leader's expectations. Filled with rage, our protagonist could only think about how the family leader was power-hungry and cared only about maintaining his own strength. He also thought that this was the reason why the leader pretended not to know anything when Cain's father and brother were killed. In this scene, we see how Cain Rogel's memories began to flow into the protagonist's mind immediately after birth. He remembered perfectly how Cain's brother and father had taught him about the true meaning of family love. At that moment, he understood the value of the human beings whom in his former life as the Lord of Dragons he had seen as worthless. But the memories of that fragile happiness wouldn't last long as he remembered how one night, soldiers entered his home, causing the deaths of his father and brother, who died protecting Cain. The protagonist could recall in Cain's memories the feeling of fear that he had never experienced in his life as the Lord of Dragons. In that moment, he was saved by his current tutor, Reban, whom he held in high regard. Returning to the current scene, our protagonist asks Reban why he had stayed by his side all this time. The protagonist knew his tutor's abilities and knew that he could easily advance to a more favorable position for himself. To this, Reban replies, it's because you're a fencing genius. The protagonist asks if Reban is crazy because Kane has already spent more than five years in the training camp and still can't enter the castle to meet the new leader's mandate. Reban responds that Kane already has the necessary skills to leave the training camp and that it's Kane himself who hasn't wanted to leave training. Just a few days after joining the training camp, he was able to master the second combat state. The protagonist, who had tried to hide his strength from everyone, thought about how strong Reban was, as he had read behind his mask. Then, Reban, to confirm his words, mentions that he trusts Cain and that the reason he has stayed by his side is because he believes in his potential and the bright future ahead of him. But Reban is hiding more than just the fact that the protagonist is concealing his strength. We are taken back to a scene in the past, on the day when soldiers entered Cain's home. Reban entered the mansion desperately searching for any family member still alive but only saw the bodies of the dead soldiers who had entered. He couldn't believe that with the little strength young Cain had, he was able to carry out all those acts. This reveals that Cain was never saved by Reban in the past, instead, it was Cain himself who defeated the entire army of soldiers. A secret that he shares with the protagonist. The scene takes us back to the training camp, where Reban invites our protagonist to see a place in the castle. The protagonist wonders where Reban is taking him and what that strange energy is that grows stronger as they approach the end of the passage. When they arrive at the place, they find a door, and Reban reveals that it's the tomb of the first Rod Gel and the family's founder. Reban confesses to the protagonist that he brought him to the tomb to console him and give him confidence because it's a place that only the heads of the Rodgel family can access. Our protagonist, excited because he had not only found the tomb of the first Rodgel but also sensed the sealed energy of his second apprentice as the Lord of Dragons, Dermond, the Silver Dragon, known for his barrier and sealing magic abilities. The protagonist wonders why his second apprentice, who was known for his hatred of humans, had his energy here. On the other hand, Reban tells our protagonist that the founder's tomb is a very special place because in times of chaos, the first founder was blessed by the sword, which helped protect the kingdom. The first rod gel, where his remains rest, could only be accessed with rod gel blood, and it had to be a worthy person to open the door. 
Reban refers to the fact that only family members with great swordsmanship skills would be able to open the door, then swings his sword, releasing great power that opens the founder's tomb. Once the door is open, Reban tells the protagonist that with the family's skills, he too will be able to open the door someday. However, our protagonist could only sense a strange and malevolent energy emanating from inside the tomb. Meanwhile, our story takes us to a neighboring kingdom, the Kingdom of Eudesia, where we are introduced to Prince Erden. He mentions his excitement at soon meeting Exegar, which makes us think that the prince of that kingdom knows the truth about the Lord of Dragons and his past. We see how Prince Erden begins to cough up blood in a castle room, and his terrified servant watches as the prince's body begins to transform into a demon, ultimately devouring the servant. This suggests that Prince Erden knows about the Lord of Dragons' past because he was a demon. As Erden's companion offers to help clean up the blood, the prince asks her to send an attack to the kingdom of Rafa. Returning to the founder's tomb of the Rodgel family, and once the doors are opened, our protagonist follows Reban inside, thinking that he should hurry to find Dermond to get answers. Once they reach the end of the room, Reban tells our protagonist to pay his respects to the resting place of the family's founder. But our protagonist can only think about how there is no way Dermond would have prepared such a powerful barrier just to protect a human's tomb. He wonders what his disciple hid in the tomb since he felt powerful energy emanating from the sword inside the crystal. As they are leaving the tomb, our protagonist asks his tutor if he could give him the book containing the family's sword arts. This book is only given to family members who have mastered the basics of the Rod Gel family's combat techniques, and our protagonist wanted access to the knowledge in the book to enter the founder's tomb and unlock the secrets it held. Reban refuses to give him the book since he hasn't met the minimum conditions, but our protagonist insists because he already knows what he can do with a sword. Seeing the passion and determination of the protagonist, Reban decides to relent and hands him the book of the family's combat arts. Reban asks the protagonist to follow him, thinking that it's time for him to learn the combat arts to prepare for the dangers that lie ahead in the future. Next, we see our protagonist sitting on the floor of his room, reviewing the book of combat arts while thinking that it feels strange. It's a closed book that can only be opened with rod gel blood. The book has different levels of difficulty, and as you progress, you can unlock different powers of the rod gel family's combat art. Our protagonist, having lived a life as the Lord of Dragons, knew that he should start at a more advanced level due to his extensive combat experience. We see how the protagonist is able to achieve high-level skills in less than an hour, so he decides to return secretly to the founder's tomb to unlock the energy trapped within the barrier. Once our protagonist is in front of the door, he remembers the movements his tutor made to open it. He believes that, for someone who reached the tenth level of magic in his past life, this will be child's play. Repeating his tutor's steps, our protagonist easily opens the founder's tomb. Once in front of the crystal, our protagonist knows that he won't be able to release the barrier with the level he learned from the book. However, our protagonist had the advantage of knowing Dermond's sealing abilities and how to modify them to access the trapped energy. Once our protagonist successfully releases the energy within the crystal, we see an arm extending from the inside, and from it emerges a mysterious woman. Immediately, our protagonist recognizes her from his past life as the Lord of Dragons. It is Nerline, a former enemy that he had sealed himself. Nerline, unaware that she is in front of Exegar, the ancient Lord of Dragons, angrily lunges at Cain, mentioning that she couldn't believe such a dangerous weapon was entrusted to the human race. Our protagonist skillfully dodges Nerline's attack and then delivers a blow to her neck. Seeing the protagonist's movements, Nerline can clearly distinguish the silhouette of her old enemy Exegar and then falls unconscious. The scene takes us to Nerline's memories from the time when dragons ruled, encountering Exegar in one of their first battles. It was a challenging battle where both were evenly matched, 
but Exegar, the almighty lord of dragons, moved into Seal Nurline, leaving a mark in the history books, now only a fairy tale. We see that in the present day, in the library of the Rajel family, Raya Rajel is examining the book containing the battle between Exegar and Nurline. She is researching the origins of the past's history and finds a clue about the starting point of the kingdom's history. She stands up and mentions that it's time to meet someone pathetic. Returning to the current moment, we see how our protagonist wakes up Nurline, who had fallen unconscious from their battle. Nurline wonders how a child was able to break the seal, thinking that it must be a member of the Rodgel family since only they could release her. Nurline explains to the protagonist that she is the spirit residing within the sword and that a young child couldn't possibly wield her due to her immense power. However, our protagonist mocks the tiny Nurline, who can't use all her powers or her original form due to the sword adapting to its owner's power. Nurline complains about the unfairness of the situation, as the only way to release the seal is with advanced knowledge of the Rodgel family's combat art, which our protagonist didn't have. The protagonist only reminds Nurline that, by releasing the seal, they have entered into a forced master-servant contract. Nurline then proceeds to cry out of frustration. Once Nurline calms down, our protagonist asks her why she was sealed in that tomb, even with the power of the silver dragon Dermond. Nurline explains that it was done out of fear of her disappearing. She reveals that hundreds of years ago, Nurline, Dermond, and the first founder joined forces to establish the First Nation after the demon's attack. The three of them were the rulers of this nation, but Nurline's unstable energy, combined with her extensive use of power, was causing her existence to deteriorate. At that time, at the Founder's request, she asked the Silver Dragon Dermond to seal her to prevent her extinction, as the only way for her to continue living was through a contract with her future owner. Nurline, after telling the story to the protagonist, offers Dermond's diary to learn more details about what happened after the Great War against the demons. Several hours have passed, and our protagonist is reading the memories stored in Dermond's diary. After the death of Exegar, the silver dragon and Dermond's second disciple, Dermond found traces of mana from the spell soul memories that our protagonist cast to reincarnate. Dermond followed the trail of the soul memories, which are visible to dragons, and saw how this trail split into two paths. One trail leads to the kingdom of Rapha, and the other leads to the kingdom of Eudesia. Because Dermond didn't know which trail to follow and was losing time due to confusion, he decided to pursue the stronger trail leading to the kingdom of Rapha, where he first encountered the first Rodgel and now the founder of the Rodgel family. For this reason, he decided to stay with the first founder until he witnessed his master's reincarnation. We return to the current situation, where Nurline tells the protagonist that someone is approaching. It turns out to be Raya, the ninth strongest fighter of the Rodgel family, who came to visit because she wanted to meet her cousin Cain. Our protagonist knew that Raya was a problem he couldn't avoid, so he decides to take the initiative to welcome her. Initially, Raya is unable to recognize her cousin Kane because she only knew him as a loser incapable of fighting and without the dignity of belonging to the family. However, she later thinks that these were unfounded rumors, as when she is face to face with Kane, she feels that he is a strong fighter. After some time, our protagonist is confronted by Raya's guard, accusing him of being disrespectful for not greeting the ninth strongest fighter of the family. However, our protagonist is not intimidated by a guard from another family and accuses him of daring to interfere in a Rodgel family conversation. The guard immediately apologizes to Raya for the scene he caused, but Raya tells him that she is not the one he should apologize to and that he should stand up quickly to avoid humiliating me. After saying goodbye to Raya Rajel, our protagonist decides to return to his room, while Nurline finds it unusual that Kane would mock a simple guard. Our protagonist responds that he used to project the image of a loser and that it was essential to change that image within the Rajel family. 
Indignant at our protagonist's response, Nerline tells him that the founder of the Rod Gel family would never have treated a guard that way and that's why she gave her blessing to the founder. Our protagonist takes the opportunity to ask what the blessing is for, and Nerline responds that the entire Rod Gel family can harness the strength of their bodies and accumulated mana to transform it into energy. Immediately, our angered protagonist realizes that it's because of Nerline that his body is so weak and incapable of gathering mana to cast his old spells. Now we see Raya's guardian and Reban in the guest hall of the recruit camp. Raya asks the guardian to apologize to Reban for the scene he caused with her pupil Kane and to disband the warrior troop he was leading. Raya tells the guardian that how could he call himself a knight after humiliating his teacher and then asking her to leave the recruit camp. The guardian could only become more infuriated with the protagonist for putting him in such a precarious situation in front of his teacher. Next, we see Raya talking with Reban, asking if, before leaving the recruit camp, there was a place she wanted to visit, the founder's tomb. Once at the tomb, we see how Raya uses an advanced technique from the Rod Gel family's combat arts book to free the founder's sword encased in crystal. She breaks the crystal in half with the force of this technique, only to find that there is no sword inside. Raya couldn't believe it and shouts, asking where the founder's sword had gone. At the same time, in the kingdom of Udesia, we see the prince embedding his arm into his companion's body to give her a weapon capable of fighting the founder's sword, which is currently in the protagonist's possession. Grateful for the prince's gift, the companion promises to fulfill her mission. The prince tells his companion to enjoy her new ability and expresses his hope that Exegar is prepared to receive his gift. Back in the recruit camp, we see Raya confronting our protagonist and accusing him of spending five years at the recruit camp just to steal the Rod Gel family's legacy, the Founder's Sword. Our protagonist immediately denies knowing what she's talking about, but Raya threatens to reveal to the entire Rod Gel family that Kane is not the loser they all believe him to be if he doesn't tell the truth. Our protagonist realizes that Raya knows where to apply pressure because there's nothing more troublesome than family politics. Our protagonist decides to reveal what he found in the Founder's tomb, stating that he managed to release the Founder's sword and also found the sixth page or lost ability in the Rod Gel family's combat arts book. Raya is incredulous because she had mastered the book's existing five pages and wonders if our protagonist thinks he can keep that missing page from her. Our protagonist confidently tells her that while she can try to take the missing page, she would never be able to uncover the secret of the sixth page, as only the owner of the founder's sword can reveal its secrets. Some time later, our protagonist takes Raya to his room, where he had hidden the book's sixth page. He allows Raya to attempt to uncover the page's secret with Rod Gel blood, but the sixth page does not react. Our protagonist reaffirms that he is the only one capable of revealing its secrets to proceeds to teach it to Raya. Immediately, the ninth strongest fighter of the Rod Gel family asks Kane what he wants in return for teaching her the family's secret technique. Without hesitation, our protagonist asks Raya to become his servant in exchange for teaching her the secret technique. Raya agrees with one condition, that she won't be given orders that would divert her from her goal. Our protagonist asks what her goal is, and Raya responds that it is to become the new head of the Rod Gel family and that in the process, it may be necessary to kill some Rod Gels. Similarly, if Kane interferes with her goal, she would kill him immediately. Our protagonist without hesitation asks Raya if the list of Rod Gels she needs to kill includes his mother. Raya responds that no ant is on the list, to which our protagonist replies that he doesn't care about the other ants or any other member of the Rod Gel family as long as it's not his mother. We then see a scene where Raya swears loyalty to our protagonist, sealing the master-servant contract. That same night, our protagonist is lying in his bed, commenting that he has made preparations to surpass his limits, but there are two ways to do it. You can achieve enlightenment through training and time or you can force it. The first way is through time and training, while the forced way is faster but can cost one's life. 
Our protagonist decides to take the path of forced enlightenment, as with his vast knowledge, he understands that he needs to release all the accumulated aura in his body to overcome his current limitations. As he releases the aura, he reflects on his journey from his first encounter with Nerline to his reunion with the Rod Gel family. He thinks about his ultimate goal of finding his master and the importance of the Rod Gel family's founder's sword in that quest. With determination, our protagonist continues to release his aura and embarks on the path to unlocking his true potential. On the following day, our protagonist meets with his mentor, Reban, to ask if he can use the teleporter. Reban asks him why he wants to go to the castle now, to which our protagonist replies that it's to comply with a new policy implemented by the head of the family and also to visit his beloved mother. As they walk towards the teleporter, Nerline asks our protagonist why he has to go to the castle, noting that if he doesn't, Reban already knows his abilities and they can't cast him out of the family. The protagonist tells Nerline that in order to change the family's reputation, it's necessary to go and show the Rod Gel family their true position as a member of the family. Nerline can't help but think that Kane's look is similar to that of his former arch-rival, Exegar, but that's impossible because the Lord of Dragons, Exegar, passed away over 6,000 years ago. Once at the portal, they activate the teleporter to immediately arrive at the castle where the evaluation would take place. Upon arrival, they are greeted by the leader of the knight's troop, who pays his respects to the protagonist and escorts them to the castle at Reban's request. When they reach the castle's entrance, the troop leader asks our protagonist about the sword he wields, stating that it's very similar to one he knows, and asks how he obtained it. Kane avoids answering the question and says he found the sword lying on the street, but the troop leader already knows it's the founder's sword. He can only think that if a rod gel possesses the founder's sword, a family bloodbath is imminent. Our protagonist enters the castle and is received by his nanny, who can't believe the young family member has returned home. Nanny, with memories of the weak young boy, tears up at the sight of how much our protagonist has grown. Once inside the castle, our protagonist gazes at the images of his father and brother, who gave their lives to protect him when he was a child. Suddenly, he is interrupted by the entrance of Cain's mother, just for a heartwarming mother-son reunion. The mother can't believe how much her son has grown. While the whole family enjoys tea, Nanny tells Cain that she was holding a letter addressed to him. To the protagonist's surprise, it's an invitation letter for all the cousins of the Rod Gel family to gather at the main castle for a party. The worried mother asks Cain not to attend the party because it's organized to humiliate him. Nanny also thinks she can talk to the host to offer apologies as she's concerned for the young man she raised as her own child. To ease their concerns, Cain tells his mother and Nanny not to worry as he's not the same person as before and regrets worrying them so much. His mother tells him he doesn't have to apologize for who he was, but Cain interrupts and says he does have to apologize for deceiving them into believing he was weak. Immediately, Cain releases his energy to show them that he's no longer the same as before and that's why he's interested in attending the gathering, to prove that his family cannot be underestimated. His mother immediately realizes that her son has changed and is no longer the weak person from the past, so she gives him permission to attend the party. As she leaves the room, Nerline asks our protagonist what he plans to do, and Kane responds that the first thing he'll do is make it clear to the family who the future head of the house is. Several days pass, and the day of the party arrives. We see how all the Rod Gel family cousins wonder if Kane will actually attend the party. We see how Bon, one of the Rod Gel cousins and the current master of the Guardian, comments on how intrigued he is to see what Kane, the loser, is like. The Guardian, being the last to see Kane, responds that there's nothing special about him, so his current master shouldn't be upset. However, the Guardian knows this is a lie, having witnessed firsthand the changes in our protagonist. As we see the heiress of the Finn family and Reban's daughter make her entrance, everyone is amazed by her beauty, but the heiress is only interested in knowing where her old friend Kane is. 
At the entrance, Fritz is there to welcome the heiress and invite her to explore the surroundings, but he is interrupted by the heiress's excitement when she recognizes Kane among the guests. We see how the heiress is thrilled to reunite with her old friend, but the protagonist is not very interested in her. The rest of the guests wonder how it's possible for the heiress to be so interested in a loser like Kane. Fritz approaches our protagonist to greet him, but Kane interrupts him and asks where Raya is, as he needs to speak with her. Fritz responds that she is still in the village, while thinking about how it's impossible for the loser to speak so casually about the ninth strongest warrior in the Rajel family. During this time, Bon approaches our protagonist to greet him. Nerline asks Kane if he knows this person, but our protagonist responds in front of Bond that it's as if she paid attention to every ant walking beneath her feet. Bond says he can't believe our protagonist doesn't remember their time at the recruit camp, then proceeds to inform him that he graduated from the academy long before Kane did. Our protagonist, understanding they are making fun of him, pretends not to know what Bon is talking about to receive his congratulations, while Bon thinks about how clumsy and incomparable they both are, he is already an advanced rank swordsman, whereas Kane just graduated from the recruit camp, so he decides to humiliate the protagonist by breaking his hand bones when he shakes hands. However, contrary to Bond's expectations, he not only fails to break Kane's hand, but Kane fractures Bond's hand. Immediately, Bond's guardian appears to defend his master, and Kane comments that it's only fitting that a loser master should have a loser guardian, provoking Bond's guardian. Unable to bear Kane's humiliations any longer, Bond responds with an insult, but our protagonist has already set his plan in motion to change the Rod Gel family's perception of him and his mother. He proceeds to strike Bond's guardian in front of the entire family. Faced with this situation, Bond's older brother appears and points at our protagonist, asking how he dares to cause such a scene and harm his younger brother. The protagonist responds that he was only defending himself against Bond's mockery, and all the guards surround him to detain him, but the heiress intervenes, accusing the guards of daring to raise a hand against a family member in their own castle. Bond tells the heiress not to interfere because he is the owner of the royal guard and can do as he pleases. However, he is interrupted by Raya Rajel, who has just arrived at the party. Raya greets Kane but is interrupted by Bon, who tells her not to interfere in this matter, announcing that Kane used a dirty trick to injure and insult his younger brother and must pay for it. Our protagonist asks the owner of the guard if he had a need to die while releasing a threatening combat energy. Immediately, Raya intervenes by insulting the owner of the guard without knowing it was for his own protection. She tells him that he's making a mistake by attacking a family member with his entire guard backing him up, and that it's not like a rod gel. The owner of the guard defends himself by announcing that Kane started the fight, but the rest of the family couldn't believe that Kane, the biggest loser in the family, could harm his younger brother. Raya decides to resolve this dispute through a duel to avoid unnecessary conflicts and involving more people, which will take place in two days, and both warriors agree. During the night, we see Bon in pain at his home while his mother asks him what happened. Nanny tells the lady to calm down, and the mother hits Nanny, saying how could she be calm when her little son's hand is broken, and a loser used a dirty trick to hurt her son. She asks her eldest son and the owner of the guard to cut both of Kane's arms in the upcoming battle, and that she never liked Alina's son anyway. Back at the main castle, we see the maids discussing the events that happened at the party and they approach Nanny to beat her up at the request of Bond's mother. We return to Kane's castle where the mother is worried because Nanny hasn't returned yet and our protagonist has a bad feeling about this. Suddenly, they hear a noise outside the castle. When they go to check, they find the horrible scene of Nanny, who has been injured and left on the outskirts of the castle. Everyone rushes to see Nanny to find out what happened. Nanny tells Kane that he still has time to withdraw from the fight if he apologizes immediately, and he can still back out if he promises not to go to the battle tomorrow. 
Our furious protagonist tells his mother to wait because he's going to settle an unfinished business and promises to fulfill Nanny's request. He says he won't go to the fight tomorrow because it has been moved up to today. Nerline asks Kane to calm down, but the protagonist can't let the harm done to Nanny go unpunished just for revenge on him. He arrives at Bond's castle with a loud crash. The guards ask him if he came to apologize and cancel the duel, but Kane immediately attacks the guards to make his way into the castle and tells them he came to destroy the place. At the same time, we see Bond's family enjoying dinner when the maid approaches the mother to tell her that they have completed their task. The mother, happy, says that Kane is probably regretting what he did, and she asks her son to make sure Kane doesn't stand a chance in the battle tomorrow. They are then interrupted by the noises from the main hall, and the eldest son runs to see what's going on, thinking it might be an ambush, but who would dare to ambush the castle of his father Bagan, the fifth strongest warrior in the Rod Gel family. It's Kane who is beating up all the guards in his way to seek revenge. After tossing several knights into the air, a swordmaster and the mother's chief guard step forward to stop him. The swordmaster asks Kane why he's causing this commotion and says the Rod Gel family won't let him get away with it. Kane tells him to shut up and launches a powerful attack. The swordmaster asks a subordinate who the person that broke in was, and he replies that it's Kane Rod Gel, the young man scheduled to fight the young lord tomorrow. The swordmaster realizes that the family had been tricked by the rumors about Kane and asks him why he's interrupting their house. Kane replies that a member of this family harmed someone dear to him, and he's here to settle the score. The swordmaster asks him what he wants to achieve. Kane replies that he wants both sons' arms cut off so he can retire, and he came personally to take them. The swordmaster tells Kane that he won't allow that to happen, but Kane says no one will stop him and, if necessary, he'll have to teach the swordmaster a lesson. They immediately engage in combat, and the master realizes he can't defeat Kane alone, so he calls for help from other guards, considering the monster he's facing. In another scene, we see the elder son of the family running desperately to see what the ambush was about, only to find the sword master thrown by Kane's power. Kane tells him he's here to seek revenge for what they did to his nanny, but the young man insists he has no idea what he's talking about. This confusion is real as the plan was devised by the young man's mother. The protagonist calls the young man a coward while he can't believe how Kane managed to get through the hundreds of guards protecting the castle. The young man knows he's facing someone more powerful than him, so he starts apologizing, but the protagonist won't let him go and tells him he won't have a problem with losing an arm to compensate for the damage. Suddenly, the castle gates burst open to reveal the arrival of the entire Rod Gel family army, who were on their way to protect the castle of Bagan, the young man's father. We see the leader of the troop shocked by the damage Kane caused in the castle. The young family member immediately points at our protagonist, claiming he broke into the castle to cut his arm off. The troop leader asks Kane why he invaded the castle in such a manner, to which the protagonist responds that a member of this family harmed someone dear to him, and he has come to settle the score. The troop leader asks Kane if this fight was to establish authority, and the young man confirms, leading to the troop leader's announcement that nobody should interfere in this battle for position within the Rod Gel family. The young family member, upon hearing these words, starts running for his life but our protagonist stops him. The young man tells Kane that if he cuts off his arm, his father Bagan, the fifth strongest warrior of the family, will not let him live. To this, the protagonist responds by sliding his sword to cut off the young man's arm instantly, telling him that neither he nor his father can stop what they've started. In another scene on the battlefield, we see Bagan learning about what happened to his family. He asks the messenger to repeat what he said before. The messenger tells him that his sons lost their arms because of Cain. Bagan responds with a strong blow, showing his anger, ready to return home to kill Cain. Immediately, Sir Jen, the second strongest warrior of the Rod Gel family, enters to stop him. 
Fagan tells him not to interfere in his family matters, but Ser Gen responds that he himself requested to lead this battle and that the harm to his sons isn't enough reason to avoid the fight under the name of the Rod Gel family. If Fagan continued, he would kill him on the spot. Ser Gen tells him that if he's interested in going to see his family, he would have to get rid of the enemy as quickly as possible. We see Bagan becoming furious, and Ser Gen withdraws from the tent, thinking about his beloved Alina and regretting not having killed Cain that night years ago. And here ends the summary of the incredible story of the Dragon Lord Exegar and his current life as young Cain Rod Gel, trying to reach the top now in a human body, facing all the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you for joining us on this adventure and if you want to receive more stories of the best Manawas, do not hesitate to like, click on the notification bell and share with all your friends. Remember, this is your good friend Jake and we'll see you on our next adventure.